Our scripture reading this morning is once again Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 17. Our focus this morning will be on verses 13 through 15, but I'll be reading the first 17 verses, which basically constitutes the whole of the introduction to this epistle. Romans chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. This is the word of our God. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all the nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. To all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed in all the world. For God is my witness, whom I serve with my spirit and in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers, asking that somehow by God's will I may now at last succeed in coming to you. For I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as the rest of the Gentiles. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his holy word. Now, some of you may be familiar with the entertainers known as Penn and Teller. Now, they are mostly a magician act, uh, but they do a lot of other things as well in entertainment. But one of the things about Penn and Teller is that Penn in particular, well, Teller, he's more almost like Harpo Marx. And if you don't know who Harpo Marx is, don't worry about it. But he doesn't really say much. That's part of the whole act. But one of the things in particular about Penn, Penn Gillette is his name, is that he is an avowed atheist, or at least he used to be. And some years back, it was fascinating, at the end of one of their shows, a man was standing off to the side and he had some of the props from the show that Penn and Teller used to hand out. But as his turn came to come up to him, he gave him a Gideon Bible, really a Gideon's New Testament. You know, those little pocket New Testaments that you find. And he basically said to Penn, he goes, he said, I'm not crazy. I'm, I'm a businessman. I am sane. I am just kind of proselytizing you and, and giving this to you. Oh, it's fascinating because at that time, Penn was an avowed atheist. But there's a clip of him, a video clip of him indicating he did not get upset. In fact, he understood exactly why this man came up and tried to give him a New Testament, why this man came up and tried to proselytize him, even in just a small way. Penn put it like this in, in the video in terms of sharing the gospel and proselytizing. How much do you have to hate somebody to not proselytize? How much do you have to hate somebody to believe that everlasting life is possible and not tell them that? 
If I believed beyond the shadow of a doubt that a truck was coming at you and you didn't believe it and that truck was bearing down on you, there's a certain point where I tackle you and this is more important than that. The man said that as an avowed atheist. And sadly today, many Christians fear sharing the gospel with the lost because of the backlash. Now, to be sure, there are times where we get backlash. We get that world's hatred outwardly expressed against us. We, in such cases, lose the sense of obligation we have to be those who bring the good news of Jesus Christ. And for the Church of Christ, that is not actually an option. We're here in Romans chapter 1. We've been taking our time, looking and making our way through this introduction. And I've also been warning you that as we, we finally get to verse 18, and really verse 18 through the middle of chapter 3, it's going to be, for the most part, a miserable time for all of us. You're a sinner. Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, is reminding us we're sinners. But next Lord's Day, Lord willing, as we get to verses 16 and 17, we get the overarching theme of the whole epistle, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of Jesus Christ that saves sinners. Now here as we're looking at the Apostle Paul's words in verses 13 through 15, we're seeing the sense of obligation that Paul has to share the good news with the lost because it's that important to him. It matters to him. So what I hope to show out of this text this morning is simply this, that the church has an obligation to bring the gospel to all men everywhere as God's providence allows. The church has an obligation to bring the gospel to all men everywhere as God's providence allows. I'm going to look at this under just two headings. First of all, Paul's intention to visit, and then secondly, Paul's obligation to evangelize. Paul's intention to visit and Paul's obligation to evangelize. So first of all, Paul's intention to visit. Look again at verse 13. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers, that I have often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented, in order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. That first expression, I do not want you to be unaware, it's actually worded this way, because it's sort of a double negative. It's worded that way for rhetorical effect. We do this kind of thing ourselves. We'll say things like, not a few. And usually what we really mean by that is a whole lot. What Paul is saying here when he says, I do not want you to be unaware, what he's really saying is, I want you to take special attention to what I'm about to tell you. You need to be aware of this. And this emphasis may be there, as we've mentioned in the past couple weeks, because it's quite possible, because at least at this point, Paul had not yet visited Rome, had not been to the Roman church, had not had any ministry there. And so people there, no doubt, were probably being told that Paul doesn't really care about you because if he did, he'd make his way here. And so he's making sure his hearers know that he does want to go there. He's making his case to them and does so affectionately. Notice he says, I do not want you to be unaware, which we take as a strong indication, hey, pay attention, I want you to know, be aware of my intention. But he also calls them brothers. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. There's an affection there, and see, that too is a remarkable thing when you think about the fact that this is a church he has yet to visit. And he calls them brothers. It's a reminder to all of us 
that even though there are millions upon millions of true believers in this world that we do not know, yet they are our brothers in Christ. They're spiritual siblings. We all have God as our Father. And there should always be some kind of an affection, a, a spiritual yet emotional draw to fellow believers. I do not want you to be unaware, brothers. Now, Paul, for Paul, the word brothers, it's used just over a hundred times in his epistles, 14 times here in Romans. It matters to him. It matters to him the relationship that we have one to another. We are not isolated Christians one from another. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. We should view each other that way. But now he states it here. I fully intended to come. I have often intended to come. It's a good translation here by the ESV, though the word often actually comes first. That often I have intended to come. To emphasize the point, He's thought long and hard numerous times that he wants to go. Often I intended. He lets his brothers, brothers he's never met, he lets them know of a desire to go and visit. I mean, we understand this as well. Sometimes in our own lives, in our own walks, just in, in general everyday kind of things, we hear of something that sounds good, that we should be there and make every effort to be there. And we even say, I'll see what I can do. Let me see what my schedule can, can allow. And then something comes up and you just can't. God's providence. And you recognize, does that somehow, the, the reality that somehow in God's providence, you're actually not able to go, diminish your desire to go? I mean, after all, all of us probably could think of a desire to go on a vacation right now. But in God's providence, it's not time yet. We still have to work. We still have to do this. We still have to do that. It doesn't diminish the desire to go on a vacation, does it? So it is here with Paul on a much grander scale. He often intended to come, but was unable to. That does not diminish his desire. And that's important for them to understand and for them to know. Paul notes in particular, he often intended to come to you, but thus far have been prevented. This is prior to his imprisonment. So it's not like persecution in and of itself kept him from going. He's been prevented from going. This is something that he mentions again later in chapter 15 about being prevented from going. He's not making excuses, or more accurately, they're not lame excuses. They're legitimate excuses. Paul was a busy man. You can read about it in the book of Acts. You can read about some of the things that he did in Galatians. You can read about some of what he did in 2 Corinthians. Paul was quite busy. There were a number of individuals that he was concerned about, number of churches that he planted and sought to minister to even from afar. Paul was simply a busy man, legitimately so. And thus, really, this epistle, again, just by way of a reminder, is really Paul's attempt to prepare the way for when he finally does come. Paul intended to come, and we know from the book of Acts, he comes as a result of having been arrested, having been thrown in prison, having been stuck for two years, and eventually appealing to Caesar. That's when he finally gets to Rome. But at this point, he still has not been able to, and yet he wants to. He's been providentially hindered. And this is a thing that sometimes we need to remember, is that sometimes the things that we want God has other plans. And we're good at saying that. 
we're good at knowing that truth in our mind. It's a lot more difficult when we have to apply it to our lives. That's when the impatience comes. It's much like the jokes that we sometimes hear of families traveling on a long distance in the car and the kids are constantly, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? This is our attitude sometimes. We say in our hearts and minds, like we know God has a plan, but is the plan ready to unfold now? Is now the time? And yet we're providentially hindered for whatever the reason may be. So it was with the Apostle Paul. He had every intention of going. So this reminds us that really the church there in Rome had to learn the lesson of patience. But it's also a lesson that you and I need to remember. Patience. Now, I realize you've also heard me say, you got to be careful when you pray for patience. Because how do you learn patience? The Lord's going to put things in your life to teach you patience. And usually, though we won't say it, our attitude is like, that's not really what I had in mind. But they needed to learn patience. But Paul has every intention of going. And notice part of the purpose in what he wishes to do. In order that, it's a purpose statement. In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. In order that I may reap some harvest. The word harvest could be fruit. I may reap some fruit, and that's fine too. It's a perfectly legitimate translation. Also, the you in among you, we don't see it here in the English, but it's plural. It's among all of you. It's not just any one individual. It's not just the hierarchy of the church. It's not just the elders of the church. It's all of them. It's every one of them bearing some fruit. But what is this fruit? What is the fruit here or the harvest that Paul is speaking of? It could refer to things like the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, etc., That's certainly true. And we also need to recognize that when we read that in Galatians chapter 5, the fruit of the Spirit, that's not actually even an exhaustive list. It's also not impossible that he's thinking of potential conversions in Rome. There are Christians there already. He's writing to them. But no doubt, like so many other places that Paul goes to, he goes with an evangelistic fervor and a desire to plant churches in those individual cities. But much of that involves his evangelistic efforts, the sharing of the good news of the gospel. That may also be what he's referring to. That I may reap a harvest, that we may bring in more converts into the church. That's his goal, to preach the gospel, to bring in fruit, to bring in this harvest. And he does so, and he reminds the Romans, it's a harvest among you, all of you, as well as among the rest of the Gentiles could be translated just as also among the rest of the Gentiles. Same thing. What Paul is doing here at the end of verse 13 is basically in a very gentle and simple way. Paul is reminding the Roman believers that they are not the only pebble on the beach. He's got others that he's looking to reap a harvest from. Paul can't be in two places at once. He might might actually say he can't be in 15 places at once, given the number of churches he planted and the responsibilities that he has and the things that he tried to do, even as he's planting churches that he tried to do for the church in Jerusalem. Rome needed to be reminded, you know, there are other Gentiles too. There are others out there that 
currently need me. And that's part of the providential hindrance that kept Paul at that point from being able to go. And this, of course, becomes a hard lesson for us as well. Because sometimes we need to understand in our own situations, we're not the only pebble on the beach. We need to remember that simply because I have a question or I'm going through a hard time or I've got this difficulty, it does not mean that therefore every single person around me has to drop everything they do and cater to my needs and wants. Most of the time, that's really all it is. Cater to me. We also have to understand that when, even when people help, even when people legitimately help us in those times of need, they still have their own lives and their own difficulties that they have to deal with. So Paul is reminding them, I've got others to tend to as well. It's not just you. All of us know all of us have experienced at one time or another, you go to the dentist, you go to the doctor, and you sit in the waiting room. You make an appointment. My appointment's at 10 o'clock. 10.10 comes. 10.20 comes. 10.30 comes. And what's our attitude? <sighs> we get impatient. Our foot starts tapping. We get frustrated. We get upset. How often does it ever actually occur to us? And I'm speaking to myself here too, mind you. How often are we willing to consider that maybe, just maybe, the doctor or the dentist is seeing other patients that have a need in the moment? But oh no, my time. I'm growing impatient. And this is just for like appointments every day. We need to understand that even in the life of the church, we're a body of believers. And this is where sometimes our, our mentality of this is my church can go askew. As if somehow the church is there for me. By the way, I don't have a problem with using the language my church, but just remember, this church belongs to Christ. It belongs to Jesus Christ. We are his. And Paul is just gently reminding the brothers in Rome, they're not alone. There are others at the moment where I am that need me. But my intention is to come to visit, to reap that harvest. We also have to remember that this is also sometimes a hard providence. We think we have it all figured out in our head. But the Lord knows better. We were talking about this even in Sunday school as we were discussing the, uh, an overarching theme of the book of Job. The hard providences and how we think we are wise in our own eyes, but we're not when you compare it to the wisdom and providence of God. We simply need to, to trust in Him. Well, this brings us then to our second point, Paul's obligation to evangelize. Look now at verse 14. I am under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. Paul is now expanding on this aspect of his work, the fact that he is among other Gentiles and trying to reap this harvest. He's expanding on this work. He's expanding and giving better explanation, even if it is in just a succinct way. I am under obligation. Now, the word there for obligation, it, it really carries the idea of one who owes another. Paul regards himself as a debtor to these other individuals. He owes this to them. And he owes it to them 
It's an obligation for Paul because this is what Christ's will is for Paul's life. We remember that Paul described himself initially in this epistle as a servant, a bondservant, or even slave of Christ Jesus. He's called to be an apostle, not an apostle just to Rome. But he's got an obligation, and it is a massive obligation. And see, a lot of times, this is hard for us, even as Presbyterians, to remember. Being Presbyterian means we're intimately connected with other congregations within our denomination. We're intimately connected to our regional church, the Presbytery, the governing body of the regional church, and intimately connected to the General Assembly, which is a governing body of the whole denomination. The work of the minister in Presbyterian churches is not exclusive to just this particular congregation or whichever minister in their respective congregation. We serve on committees with respect to the presbytery or the general assembly. There are sometimes things we do. Granted, most of our work should be local. No question about it. It's the congregation that calls the minister after all. But nevertheless, we have an obligation to one another to serve the whole church, not just the local congregation. And the thing about it is that should be across the denomination mutually understood so that we reinforce one another in that way. Paul has an obligation to the whole church, to the whole body of Christ, not just simply to the church at Rome, a church that he hadn't even yet visited, but yet intends to. Paul has this sense of obligation, owing something to them. He tells them he's got an obligation to Greeks and to barbarians. Now, that's a rather interesting expression. Because usually in the New Testament, what we do find is something akin to Jew and Gentile. But here we've got Greek and barbarian. What in the world is going on here? It seems a little bit too early to be talking about the German horde infiltrating the Roman Empire from the north at the time. What does this mean, Greek and barbarian? Well, first of all, when speaking of Greek, it does not necessarily mean those who were from Greece those who were ethnically or born as Greeks. Really, what it has to do is those who have adopted a Greek mentality and Greek influence and Greek culture and Greek philosophy, etc. Of course, that was considered to be the epitome of civilization. Those who would not adopt such ideas, ways of thinking, ways of education, ways of speaking, those were the barbarians. They were considered uneducated, unsophisticated, illiterate, etc. And Paul is reminding the Roman church, which, of course, though in Rome, had been heavily influenced by Greek culture, etc., etc. The common language throughout the empire at this time was not Latin. It was Greek. Everyone else were barbarians. Paul is saying he's got an obligation to both. And see, what we're seeing even in this is Paul has no partiality to whom he shares the gospel. And I dare say that sometimes in our own reform circles, we tend to think that those we share the gospel with are to be the more sophisticated ones. Those are the ones more ready to, to understand it. They're the ones that are going to be more receptive. The educated ones. The ones that are really affected by the culture around us. The rest are just modern day barbarians that like to hang out in the sports bars afterwards. <laughs> 
which I kind of like to do myself, but. You see, we have also, we can very easily have also this same kind of mentality that there's a certain echelon of individual that is worthy to receive the gospel from us. And others, not so much. And so we prioritize based on social status, prioritize based on influence, prioritize based on the wealth of the individual even. Rather than simply recognizing that the person before you is a sinner that needs the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul would preach to both Greek and to barbarian. the top levels of society, and the bottom levels of society, as society views them. Also, he brings this obligation to the wise and to the foolish. Is this a different kind of comparison? Actually, probably not. It's probably more a further explaining of what he just said, with the Greeks and the barbarians, to the wise and the foolish. Because from their perspective, if you were not steeped in the Greek culture, you had to be foolish. You had to be a barbarian. All wisdom is found there. Yet the reality is we recognize that all sinners are starting on the same level playing field, dead in their sin and trespasses and in need of the saving work of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul is obligated to both. William Hendrickson, in his commentary on Romans, he actually uses the translation to carry the connotation this way. The, not so much the wise and the foolish, but the learned and unlearned. Sometimes we in our own reform circles will spend much more time focused on what the culture might say is the learned ones. Sometimes we may say, looking at the so-called uneducated ones, well, they wouldn't understand this. You see, there's an obligation to bring the gospel to all men everywhere, regardless of social status, regardless of financial situation, regardless of biological pedigree. There's an obligation to bring the gospel to all men everywhere. And this is Paul's point. I'm, I'm busy. He's saying it politely. But all these other people need me too, and this is where God has me at the moment. But I intend to come because you deserve the gospel as well. I just have been prevented thus far. How easy it is for us to focus gospel presentations to our favorite demographic while ignoring all others. In a week, we're going to be having our first VBS. Aside from our own kids here in this congregation, we have no idea what the Lord will bring to us at this point. What kind of background some of these kids might have. Backgrounds that on the outside may even look pleasant and nice. But nonetheless, still need the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are we prepared? Do we, as a congregation, have this sense of obligation to bring the gospel to all men, women, and children everywhere? no matter what kind of walk of life they come from, no matter what situation they may find themselves, 
or are we just simply going to have an attitude of, well, they must not be God's chosen ones? We are under obligation to all men everywhere. And notice, both to the wise and to the foolish. And in verse 15, so I am eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Now, one could read this as almost sort of a, a, a bit of a forcing them to ask the question, well, Paul, which one do you see me as? Am I the wise or am I the foolish? If you're asking, maybe you're, that's answering for you. See, all of us are quick to say, well, I'm not the wisest man who ever lived. But, surely I'm not that foolish. But rather than asking ourselves the question, am I wise or am I foolish? Asking the question, what's our obligation? And Paul's obligation was to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so he says, I'm eager to preach the gospel to you also who are in Rome. Verse 15 begins with the word so, as the ESV has it. Perfectly legitimate translation. It could be, if you want to expand it just a little bit, in this way. In this way, the same way that I'm obligated to preach both to the Greek and to the barbarian. In this same way. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you. Paul refers to this obligation. He knows he's obligated to bring it to Rome. So no matter what anybody may say about Paul's ministry, whatever rumors that people, whatever pessimists or cynics may be in the Roman uh, community there saying about Paul, he has not come, he hasn't come. Paul is saying in the same way, I'm eager to bring the gospel to you as well. Do you have a sense of eagerness to bring the gospel to people that you've never even met? We have a hard enough time trying to bring the gospel to people we do know. But we need this sense of obligation. Even still, at this point, as Paul pens this, it's still only a plan to go. Who knows what the future holds? Now, of course, we're 2,000 years removed. We know what happened to Paul. But as he wrote this, he's still only planning, and he's eagerly planning, and he's hoping maybe the way is, is there. You realize it was a few years after this before he finally got there. A few years, not a few days, a few years. How many of us could wait that long? How many of us could wait a few days? I am eager to preach the gospel to you. He is eager. The word there could also be willing, could also mean ready. He's ready, he's willing, he's eager to preach the gospel. Now the word here, there's a single word for preach the gospel. It's not three words or even two words in the Greek. It's actually the Greek word where we get our our verb or our word evangelism from. It's not the formal word where we get our concept of the doctrine of preaching, the science of preaching, the art of preaching. That's a completely different verb, though Paul could have certainly used that here. But he uses a word that emphasizes gospel message, good news, glad tidings. He is eager to bring good news concerning Christ. He's got a a sense of urgency to bring the gospel. He wants to evangelize. He wants to bring this good news. And see, this is the church's responsibility, to bring good news. Now, next week, as we look at verses 16 and 17, and brothers and sisters, it was hard to separate at this point. 
But I will also, on the other hand, not do you any favors by trying to combine 16 and 17 into the same sermon. But why is Paul feeling this sense of eagerness, this sense of obligation? For he's not ashamed of the gospel. He knows it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's why. And I dare say, that many of us lose that sense of obligation, lose that sense of urgency because we forget the words that come next, that the gospel is the power of God unto the salvation of everyone who believes. Do we believe that? I don't just simply mean, can we put the correct answer on a test? Do we own this as our own? Do we recognize that the gospel is the power of salvation unto all who believe? That's where the sense of urgency comes from. That's where the eagerness comes from. And that one lone individual man standing waiting for his turn after a pen and teller show wanted to hand a Gideon New Testament to them. Because it was obvious he cared. It was obvious he was concerned about the eternal state of this man's soul. Now, I have since found, maybe within the last five years, online indications that Penn may have converted to Christianity I don't know. It's like so many other celebrities of late that have announced their conversion to Christianity and then months later fall off the deep end again, never to return. But the question really is this for us. Do we love enough? Do we care enough that we have a sense of obligation to share that which is the power of God unto the salvation of souls. That's our obligation. If you're lacking this sense of obligation, pray that the Lord would instill it within your heart. Because after all, the Lord did it for somebody else to present the gospel to you because they loved and cared enough about you to bring the gospel to you. Most Christians, and I've had the opportunity to have conversations with, there's always, it almost always seems to be, there's that one individual that opened my eyes, as it were, to the gospel, that one person that cared enough Now, brothers and sisters, you have the opportunity to be that for others. As I mentioned, we have no idea what kind of background the kids that are coming here next week are going to be having with them. What kind of burdens? Except we know that they have the burden of sin unless they repent and trust in Christ. Are we prepared? to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you have that sense of urgency? Sure, we're going to have the decorations. Sure, we're going to have the snacks. Sure, we're going to have the games for the kids, and they're going to have fun. But what's the most important thing? We have the good news of Christ. Do you have that sense of obligation? Pray that the Lord would instill it within you. This was Paul's sense of urgency, his desire to share the good news, to reap a harvest. We don't know what the Lord will do. We don't. It's for him to will and to work where he pleases. We simply need to obey. We simply need to share Christ with the lost. That's what we need. That's the obligation that the apostle Paul had That's the obligation that the church of Jesus Christ has 
And that's the obligation that each and every one of us should have as we interact with the world around us. I get it. Not every instance is a gospel presentation instance, properly speaking. There's a time and a place. That man waited for his turn. He didn't just jump in front of the line and push everybody out of the way. Hey, I've got to save this man. Even though it was that urgent, in your sense of urgency, if I can put it this way, well, I'll put it a little simpler. Don't be rude about it. Let them see the love of Christ in you. Some of you know that before I became a minister, I was a teacher at an at-risk school. It was a Christian-run organization, though it was itself not a Christian school. And it was interesting, the teenagers there, they said, why is everybody here a Christian? I remember one student who was not a believer herself. She said, who else is going to care about us? Who else is going to care about us? Do you care for the lost? That my friends share Christ with them. And pray in earnest this week that the Lord would work through us to bring people into his kingdom. That they may know the joys of salvation that's found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Our Father in God in heaven, we do thank you for your word and what it reminds us and teaches us about our obligation to share the good news of Jesus Christ, the one who came to die for sinners like us. May we have an attitude and recognize the urgency that we have to share that good news to all kinds of people, regardless of their background, regardless of their demographic. Maybe we, may we all be willing to share in the same way that Paul himself was, in the same way that Christ, as he walked this earth, was. We pray all this in his name. Amen.